What does Jesus have to say about all of this political divisiveness and how we're supposed to work? What does Jesus have to say about those things other than it's okay to be gay? Yeah. So, uh, oh, and the other thing is, is that I found that we would, we would take our parents and our relatives into some of the other churches we were attending and they would just be like, this ain't church. Y'all mm-hmm. are playing. Yeah. So at St. Peter and at Cathedral of Hope Houston, I told my husband, I said, we have to strike a tone in which if my grandmother comes here, she will not feel out of place. But we also have to strike a tone that says this, we're moving forward into the future. This is young. It's vibrant. It's exciting. And uh, six months ago, my grandmother joined the church. Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Texas Forward podcast. Today, we had the pleasure of speaking to Reverend Leslie Jackson. He's the senior pastor over at St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Houston. He's a veteran of the United States Navy, and he spent years working in the private and non-profit sector before he was ordained. This was such a wonderful conversation, and I think it will resonate with anyone who feels like they don't fit neatly into the defined bucket society often tries to put us in. Leslie's story is an inspiring one that shows how great things can happen when you have faith and the courage to truly be yourself. We also talked about Reverend Jackson's work bridging the gap between the LGBTQ community and the more traditional elements of Christianity. And of course, we talked all things Texas politics and the Forward Party. We hope you enjoy and don't forget to like and subscribe. Reverend Leslie Jackson. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you've had a uh, you've had a busy busy day today. Yes, church this morning, a birthday brunch for my dad. Yeah, it's been it's been a busy day. Nice. <laughs> where uh, where for brunch? We went to this amazing Cajun Creole kind of restaurant called uh, Rupor, oh. and they have wonderful oysters. Okay. Great catfish, shrimp. Nice. French toast. See, we're pretty close to the water here in Houston, right? Yeah. So you can trust that. That seafood. Yes. Anytime. I love the seafood here. I love great, great restaurants with amazing seafood. There are quite a few here in Houston. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I always, that's kind of my rule with seafood. I'm like, how far are we from water where this is coming from for two? (laughs) Well, I got to tell you, I was in Atlanta two weeks ago and um, it wasn't that great. (laughs) Not not so much. (laughs) Yeah. The seafood was not that great. There you go. Yeah, that, that's that was my experience. I'm from Ohio originally, uh-huh. and the the Mexican food I get Mexican food all the time in Austin. Really? And man, it's not even close. When you go back, when I went back to Ohio, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> well, I, we lived in New York for about three years. I went to seminary there at Union Theological Seminary, which is part of Columbia University's network. And our first week there, I was like, I want to go and check out some. Get some Mexican food. Yeah. And this I don't is know. New York. In New York. Manhattan. So they should have everything. So they should have everything. But I I didn't realize that like I like Tex Mex. Yeah. And that's different from Mexican food. So I ordered queso and it came out as shredded cheese. <laughs> you were very confused. I was very confused <laughs> and disappointed. Yeah. Because it was queso. <laughs> It was just not melted. It was and just not melted. I would be, I would be equally confused and upset, disappointed. Yeah. So at that thing. point, I was like, I'm not going to ask for what is it, carne, carne con queso or whatever. I was like, no, I'm not going to ask for that because ground meat in the shredded cheese is probably not going to turn out too well. <laughs> <laughs> Two wrongs don't make a right not at all. <laughs> Fair enough. So, um, so church day, do you do you do multiple services or is it just one or like? What, what does that look like on a... On a it's week, it's just week, week, one week. service every Sunday at... Uh, starts at 11 a.m. Actually starts at 10.50 a.m. Okay. Uh, with a gospel house kind of... You know, all of that kind of stuff set to gospel music. And then uh, we start at 11 o'clock. Cool. Yeah, it's really... We, we try to be cool, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I love house music and dance music. And I was like, oh, and I'm a Christian and I love gospel music. So let's... See if we can bring these two together. So during the pandemic, we found two DJs 
uh, one in Baltimore and uh, one in uh, Chicago that specialize in putting house music and gospel music together. So they do our they did our intro reel for us. Uh, but we start at 11 o'clock. It's about an hour and a half long service. And it's pretty high energy. energy and um, Seems like it. I, That's tr- your opening. I try to leave it all on the dance floor. I really do. Really? <laughs> yes. So, all right. Yeah, I try to leave it all on the dance floor for sure. My husband leads the music and it's a good time. Oh, that's really awesome. Is. Yeah. I can tell you, I grew up Catholic. There were not uh, any Catholic priests leaving it all on the dance floor in our, in our mass. <sighs> yeah. You know, I think we're kind of, we're like, we're not quite to smoke machines yet. Not yet. And it's not <laughs> dim just yet. <laughs> but but, I but see it is high, high energy. We're yeah. moving in that direction. <laughs> I, th- I think so. No, hopefully no mirrors. Okay. Just no, no mirrors, but maybe a little smoke. Okay. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, interesting. So you, you choreographed, like you actually, is it, you, you made the decision to get that DJ and make those musical, I'm I'm trying to think of the word, but those production decisions. Yeah, we, um, so, so my husband and I, he, he, he grew up in a Southern Baptist church, a large Southern Baptist church. And I uh, grew up at uh, Lakewood church here in Houston when John Osteen was the pastor, not Joel Osteen. Mm. So we both come from backgrounds where our churches um, evoked a lot of emotion. Sure. And, you know, it was it was kind of hard to fall asleep when there was all of these things that were, you know, that were going on in the space. And what we found just in our research and in moving back from New York to to Houston, when my husband really wanted to stay in New York, he was like, I want to be here. This is where I want to be. This is he danced with Alvin Ailey for a bit and trained with them, went to school at Fordham. And, you know, you don't need a car like it's he, he loves it there. And um, and I told him one day, I said, you know, I, I said, the queens just don't go to church in New York. Yeah. <laughs> I said, if we're struggling to get home <laughs> by four o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, uh, I think that, you know, this is th- this is not the context for us to do what it is. We felt God was calling us to do so. We moved Fair back. Enough. We moved back here, and uh, and we knew we we surveyed the landscape and we knew all of the open and affirming churches, churches that would welcome the LGBTQ community, and we knew that none of them had kind of the flavor that we would that we could bring to uh, our our religious uh, context. So we're not quite like all the other open and affirming churches. Mm-hmm. And they were also not quite like the Pentecostal assembly of God kind of affirming churches as well, too. So uh, we're, there's not another one like us. I could, I could say that. And that was, that was an intentional decision that we made. So St. Peter's, you and your husband started the, the church? We didn't start it. I was called actually to be the pastor of a church by the name of Cathedral of Hope Houston. Okay. Which was planted by Cathedral of Hope in Dallas. Cathedral of Hope in Dallas is the largest uh, open and affirming and progressive church in this country, I believe. I think they have something like 5,000 members. So about 10 years ago, they started planting different churches here in Texas and in Oklahoma. And the church that I was called a pastor was one of those churches. Well, it struggled for a while, and then a friend of mine um, and, and, and dear colleague, uh, she was the pastor of that church. Okay. Um, and I, we had just moved back from, well, that's not true. We were back from New York, 2012, we moved back from New York, and it took about three years for a church to reach out to me, to call me, to say, we'd like to give you a job. And in the meantime, I went to different churches and met with different pastors, and we kind of shopped around to see where we could where we would land. Yeah. And one of the churches we really wanted to be at, uh, it, it, a very historic church. Uh, and, and, uh, the minister said to me that I, you know, I will absolutely support you in this and I will stand up to the, the council if I have to, because sin is sin and nobody should stop you from doing what you want to want to do. And, um, now, what, what church was this specifically? I don't want to say the name. So, okay. <laughs> we, I am st- I, we still have a lot of great relationships there. And, Understood. And so it really boiled down to some of what we'll probably talk about today is that there was a difference in theology. Yeah. And because that phrase to me was like, 
oh, I'm going to have to kind of be in the closet. I'm going to kind of have to, I can't bring my full self to this in order to become ordained or a reverend in this, in this context. Yeah. To be fully accepted right. essentially in the church. Yeah. And so, and I know my husband is never going to like, I mean, his favorite thing to do when we're out like at an airport and getting ready to board the plane and people start talking, I'm just like, Oh God, why are they talking to us? Cause they will, they will inevitably ask, so what do you do? And he loves saying, well, my husband's a pastor. And then I'm like, great. Now I'm going to have to answer all of these questions about how is that possible? Um, so I, I didn't want us to have to go through that kind of being scared to be who yeah. we are and all those things. So I, I, I went home and I told him, I said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to, we're not going to go through this process. I'm sick of it. And uh, I said, I've done everything that I can. I've tried to you know, move the pieces around. I've tried to reach out to people that I don't agree with. I said, nothing seems to be working. And I told him, I said, don't talk to me about church ever again. Mm. And mind you, like <laughs> in terms of student loan debt, like I, I owe enough to Columbia University to buy a house. <laughs> like, yeah. like I owe enough to, to the, the lenders. have been dedicated to that for a long time. Yeah. And so I was like, this is, I said, this is just not what, you know, I had planned. I hadn't planned to owe this much money. I hadn't planned for us to be in a situation where um, I can't live into the fullness of this call and this thing that I thought we were supposed to do. And so I started wrestling with like, um, at the time I was the manager of organization and culture for the Houston Food Bank. And I started seeing myself as that in that role, being in org development, I started understanding that as being a, a clergy pastoral kind of role within an organization. But even within that, I said... I uh, told him, I said, let's not mention church anymore. Let's just drop this. And uh, and I prayed to God that night. I said, I don't know why you brought me all this way. I don't know why you had me spend all this money. I said, maybe I'm delusional. I don't know what's going on. But like, I don't, I was like, if you want me, God, you're going to have to drop it in my lap. And the next day, the pastor of Cathedral of Hope Houston called and said, it's time for you to get ordained and to get off the bench. All right. And that's, <laughs> that's how, dropping that's how it happened, right? So so then I'm like, yay, let's do it. And my husband's like, I don't know if this is the church for us. It's all white lesbians and there's not that many people of color. And I'm like, I told God to drop it in my lap. I was not specific. So you blame me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so uh, I became the minister of education. Okay. And then I had to finish up my ordination process. So that took about six to nine months. And once I finished that process, it was time for me to actually have the ceremony of ordination. Okay. And at the time we were renting a space about this size in the Montrose Center. And my ordination ceremony was held at St. Peter. Mm. Well, some of the moneyed ladies in the church were very excited to have it there because they were like, we need a church building. And so once we did that test drive, which I didn't know my ordination was a test drive, uh, they decided that they wanted to lease the main sanctuary of St. Peter. St. Peter was down to nine members, so they were in their historic chapel. Oh, wow. Oh, you see how this is lining up? Yeah. <laughs> so, like six months after being ordained, I walk into the church office one morning, and the pastor that called me to tell me, asked me to get off the bench, she says, I'm sick of this, I'm done. And I said, oh, great. I said, you know, things haven't really worked out the way we want to here. And I think I understand now. And my husband really wants to be in, in New York. So let's just, I will be the interim pastor until they find someone, I, as in Cathedral of Hope, Houston. And she said, you don't understand. I prayed about it and I thought about it. The day I called you to ask you to get off the bench, I had already heard from God and had planned that you would be my succession plan, that you would be the pastor replacing me. Wow. So in a matter of like a short period of time, I went from like not having a plan to now being a pastor of this church that was really still kind of struggling to find its way because it had moved several times and everything. Um, and when I finally said, I'm going to make the changes that's necessary the changes that will liven up the, our, our theology and, and, and liven up our worship. And, and also, you know, I said, we're going to open our church to be open and affirming to everyone. Yeah. And they were like, we are. I said, no, I mean, straight people. 
and I like killed Cathedral of Hope Houston. Like I, after I said that, we dropped from like 40 people down to 20 people with music changes and we lost another five after I said we were going to welcome straight people into the church. Hmm. Because you're dealing with people that are 50, 60, 70 years old. They have never known any other safe place. Right. So to now say you're going to bring in people who, who were probably not very safe to them uh, was was challenging for some. So it was a generational you know, issue. Yeah. After I did that, after the church dropped down to 15 people, and of course I freaked out and said, okay, what am I doing here? Um, the next week, there were 15 more people in the worship. And, and the next week after that, we had 15 people join. And then the next month, we had 30 people join. And then two months later, we had 25 people. So... After I just started standing my ground and doing things the way I believe God wanted me to do it, the church just doubled and tripled and quadrupled in size in a matter of a year. And Man. by the end of that year, we were already in talks to merge with St. Peter. And that is how I became the first black gay pastor of Houston's third oldest church. That's a great story. All because I told God, drop it in my lap. <laughs> Oh, man. I couldn't have planned it better myself. And I just can't imagine what that, I mean, that's a roller coaster for sure. Yeah. Um, how good that has to feel to be authentically yourself in all ways, really, that you've described and have that just work out and be, you know, basically you're getting a message from God in this situation that that's necessary. That's what you're being called to do. It's bigger than you. You are, you, you have, you have a calling, right? And it's, specific to you it's authentic to you and you you know you took these risks right to, right. to put yourself in that situation i mean i can't that's a gotta be a great feeling yeah it's it's pretty cool it's it's still a a struggle some days i can't believe it's happening some days i can't uh you know i i just i like to be able to understand a system and process and a plan for things and God keeps saying to me, I know that's one of your strengths, but I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> and that can tend to be a little frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> but it always turns out better. That's the, the great part about it. That's faith, right? Yeah, that's faith. Interesting. Yeah, that's so St. Peter. So how long have you been, uh, been in that role now? So five years and seven months total. The first year and six months was Cathedral of Hope, Houston, and then the next four years and something was, it has been St. Peter. But we, we count them all together because we closed Cathedral of Hope, Houston, and tr merged into uh, St. Peter. So in terms of I my know. time and the password, we just say five years. Okay. Yeah. I see. So what, what made you want to open, open things up and kind of be that bridge between those two communities? So after my seminary journey and after being in a lot of different open and affirming churches, I, there's, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure I, f I frame this the right way. There's, so I'm going to say this, but I'm not poo pooing anybody else's. Yes. Yeah. Now take your time. In the open and affirming community, it tends to be very liberal in its politics and in its theology. Sure. And so there's a lot of different ways in which the service is conducted and the sermon is preached. And sometimes it can almost become like it is a social justice political rally. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's constantly focused on, it's okay for you to be gay. It's okay for you to be gay. It's okay for you to be gay. We're going to stand up to the homophobes and we're, it's okay for us to be gay. Jesus yeah. loves us. So after like, you know, two years, three years, four years, five years of that, my husband and I were just like, there must be something else. It's like, yes. Like, and, yes. <laughs> like, what does Jesus want to say to me today other yeah. than it's okay to be gay? Right. Like, I actually, like, I want to, like, punch my coworker in the face. Like, I want to talk <laughs> about, like, what does Jesus have to say about that? Right. Because there's a lot Jesus, more to you than yeah, that. Yeah. What does yeah. Jesus have to say about financial integrity? 
right? What does Jesus have to say about all of this political divisiveness and how we're supposed to work? What does Jesus have to say about those things other than it's okay to be gay? Yeah. So, uh, oh, and the other thing is, is that I found that we would, we would take our parents and our relatives into some of the other churches we were attending and they would just be like, this ain't church. Y'all mm-hmm. are playing. Yeah. So at St. Peter and at Cathedral of Hope Houston, I told my husband, I said, we have to strike a tone in which if my grandmother comes here, she will not feel out of place. But we also have to strike a tone that says this, we're moving forward into the future. This is young. It's vibrant. It's exciting. And uh, six months ago, my grandmother joined the church. That's amazing. That's I great. was late getting here because I had to take her to, I had to drive her home back to my house so she could, you know, pick up her stuff and get back in her car and go. But, but she's now a member of the church as well. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, it seems that you've struck that balance yes. successfully. That's, yeah. that's a big milestone. Yeah. It's getting, good. It is. Getting it is to join, good. It sounds. Yeah. That's great. So your, um, let's, let's back up then. So you, you grew up in Texas mm-hmm. and you were in the Navy. Mm-hmm. Five years. Okay. And so how did that kind of, how, how did your background and your upbringing shape your political views and just kind of how, who you became today? So I joined the Navy because, because uh, I was, at the time, uh, identified as a Republican. I grew up in Humble, Texas. Most of my friends were all Republicans. Uh, there were a few Republicans in my family, but, uh, you know, I was a fan of uh, Ronald Reagan, a big fan of the Bushes. This, this is, I mean, it's just the context that I grew, I, I grew up in. Sure. And and um, very patriotic, love my country, and um, and I felt that since I had kind of goofed off for a couple of years, and my mom was like, "Dude, you're either gonna get out of my house." <laughs> or I'm going to arrest you for the things I think you're bringing in my house. Because uh, I was getting home late and doing all those bad things you sure. do when you're a teenager. And you just Being finished high school. And yeah. you were... And I was a good kid. I was a very, very... Like, I did nothing wrong, ever. So, uh, finding that kind of freedom uh, to be grown, uh, I was in the streets a lot. So, my mom was like, you need to do something. And so, I, I said, well, let's... You know, I'll join the Navy. Um so I joined because even then I was very patriotic, very conservative, and and the church had disappointed me in so many ways. Uh, I was fired from youth staff because I had expressed that I had some attraction to my best friend at the time. And um, how old were you at that point? That was sixteen. Okay. Yeah. So uh, being in the Navy was was amazing. I went from E1 to E6 in a matter of three years. I graduated top of my technical training. It usually takes people about 12 years to achieve what I achieved. Um, most people promoted in, 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 a, in a unit uh, when I was there. This was this. So the, the kind of the top of my career happened right around the time 9-11 happened as well, too. In fact, we were leaving out of Singapore the day that 9-11 happened. And so my communications division on my on my aircraft carrier was responsible for all of the communications of the four aircraft carrier battle groups that were parked outside of Afghanistan Whoa. which if you know what an aircraft carrier looks like imagine its battle group all the other ships that come with it we had four of them sitting off the co- coast of Afghanistan it's a intimidating sight i bet Maybe for them intimidating, I was more scared for them. Well, yeah. <laughs> but like this is like we're gonna make you a parking lot. Like there will be nothing left. Yeah. Um, but the, my career was was great. It was amazing. I had a great time. I had a lot of support from some very conservative evangelical people who were aware that I was uh, that I was gay. I I wasn't out, but I also didn't hide it. Sure. Uh, so I had a lot of uh, a lot of great support. That's not everyone's story. I was just extremely fortunate that the people that um, that I worked for believed in me and kept giving me excellent reviews, so I can keep getting um, promoted. So yeah, it's a That's good great. ride. And so, so you were deployed. So where where um, where were you internationally during your time there? So my ship was stationed in Bremerton, Washington, and I did one tour in uh, the Arabian Gulf, and then I did the next tour right off the coast of Afghanistan because of 9-11. I mean, we were right. headed to the Gulf again, but of course, that's Different right off the reason. coast there. It's right outside of the Gulf, so we just parked there instead of going into the Gulf. So two two deployments. Got it. 
Yeah. Very interesting. So you, did you always want to, or when did you decide that you wanted to become a pastor? So prior to being terminated from or kicked off a youth staff, what like I was confident then, like God had called me to ministry and that's what I wanted to do. I mean, like what other teenager, like my mom, what she brought me to, took us to that church, but I ended up being the one, <laughs> this is hilarious. Like I, I taught myself how to drive on a stick shift standard car because one morning she didn't want to take me to church. I did have a permit. It's dedication. I didn't have a, I did have a permit. But I was not supposed to be driving alone, but I wanted to go to church. So she said I could go to church. So I just jerked all the way to church because I was like, I've got to get to church. And that's how I learned. That's how I learned. But I just, you know, and um, but I was always the person that was going to be there. Like a lot of my classmates, and other people in youth group would not be there. And that's how I ended up being on youth staff because I was always there. They could always count on me to be there. And I lived, lived, lived at the church. All of my high school classmates were like, you're part of that cult. And I can't believe and like all of that stuff. And so I knew then that's what God was calling me to do. Uh, but at the time, I had no idea what open and affirming meant. I didn't know there were churches where gay people could go and be who they are and, and worship and be a part of a. I had no idea of any of that stuff. Yeah. So uh, like many do, I turn to the streets and nightclubs and bars because that's where you find community if you're gay. There's, which is sad, right? Mm -hmm. Like you should be able to find community in your church or in a political movement or something, but that's, that's where we tend to find community. Yeah. It's, you know, there's definitely historically been a pretty big gap between, you know, the church, the Christian community and the, and the LGBT community. Um, and that had to be hard, right? Like you clearly, since you were young, had a strong draw to be a part of the church and of course you want to be who you are right and it's like yeah, i'm sure that was that was uh a challenge yeah it was rough but you know i think being a teenager is supposed to be your fun years and so in some way i think had i not have gone through everything that i went through i would be less effective as a pastor sure so one of the the benefits and advantages that i have is that I, I was not a, I'm a second career clergy person. I didn't go to, to undergrad and get a degree in religion and then go from that degree into seminary to get my yeah. master in divinity and then end up in the church. I had a career in the Navy, <laughs> right? Then joined the military and then got out of the military and had a whole nother career before even getting called to a church. So um, it has helped me to understand business and structure and all of that stuff. And so I brought all that to bear in reforming and reshaping St. Peter. And I, I don't think it would have been the same had I not have had all of these eclectic experiences that makes absolutely no sense. I was <laughs> writing about it this week in a paper for a, doc a doctoral uh, entrance essay for my next program that I hope I get into. And I was just like, this is... Dude, you're like, is there any cohesion to your yeah. resume at all? <laughs> like, you know, but somehow it all makes sense. And it is it has worked uh, uh, by evidence of St. Uh, St. Peter's success. Yeah. I mean, you look back at that and you're like, it doesn't make sense, but it makes perfect sense yes. because I wouldn't be where I'm at without any of this <laughs> right. experience. Yeah. Right? yeah, I love that. I love people who are they don't fit neatly into boxes. I was telling one of my one of my friends who um, was on the communications team, Jake, um, a while back. I was just like, the, the, I love people with contradictions because you can tell they're authentic, right? It's yeah. somebody who's, and I, I really believe in this personally in authenticity. And you know, if everybody was able to be authentic to themselves, it would yeah. be a much better world. Yeah. You know, because everyone has these specific special things that they can, you know, bring to the world that they're great at that they're meant to share and yeah. you know give, right? Yeah, I, I think a lot of, um, you know, and I haven't, I haven't preached about this a lot, but I think a lot of what has shaped me has been these moments in my life when um, there was some sort of disconnection or dismissal uh, of me. And that even, that's even for seminary, right? Mm -hmm. So in seminary, because I went to a very liberal uh, seminary, politics and theology wise, right? Um there's there were times when I was like, 
well, that's not how we would do it back in Texas. Yeah. Or, no, I don't think grandma's going to like you talking about Jesus. That Like, I was the guy in the classroom that was like, how did this conservative end, how did this gay conservative end up in this liberal seminary? And I'm like, but I'm, I w- was, but I'm not, but I don't, I don't know. All I know is like, I think you need to understand there's more to this kind, right? Yeah. And so there was a dismissal in it, it to some degree, right? And that just, That pushed me more to be like, okay, I can't take this label. I can't take that label. I don't, I don't know how to make sense of what this means. Mm -hmm. But Dr. King said something, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, writing in his Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, an essay, can't remember the year, but he wrote in there, he said, there's, he said, I've, I've studied liberal, I'm paraphrasing, I've studied liberal kind of philosophy, theology, and I've also studied Mm neo-orthodoxy. He didn't like the optimism about the human condition in in liberalism. And he also didn't like like the pessimism that was in neo-orthodoxy. You know what he said? He said, the answer is somewhere in between the two. They each possess a partial truth. And I keep going back to that again so that when I'm listening to theology and I'm listening to different political shows, I'll even sometimes I'm, you know, if I have on the news, I'll switch to Fox yeah. or I'll switch to MSNBC and then I'll switch to CNN. And I just, just to, just because I need to hear, I need to hear and I need to know what's, what, what's going on. And I think that a lot of people don't like that. People want you in a box. Well, and it's it's kind of, and I like boxes, by the way. Yeah. Like I already said, I like boxes and structure, but I, I it's easier. It's easier. That's the thing. I don't right? know what box I'm playing in. I feel like I'm playing in all boxes. Yeah, you got a lot of. <laughs> I do. It's I like do. it's like a Christmas tree. Yeah. You got a bunch of boxes. Under it. <laughs> I do, I do, but, but I feel like it's easier, right? It's like easier. It's much easier if you have a, a prescription that you just are like, okay, this is the ten things that I have to do to be not to quote like the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. Not even where I was going with that at all, but. Like just in general, this could be politically. This is a political platform, right? Mm-hmm. It's this is what we believe, and I don't have to think about it. Right. I just have to, you know, go read the talking points. Yeah. Go see what Tucker says about this. Yeah. And I don't have to think. It's a lot harder to have to think about every issue. Yeah. It's very hard. Well, that's interesting. That's fascinating because Jesus got in trouble because he started thinking about his religion. Mm. I don't know. There's a sermon in that. A sermon that you've done before? <laughs> I haven't done that one yet. Okay, <laughs> I've got to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna listen to this because I. That's that is a sermon. Wow. He got in a lot of trouble because he started questioning some religious authorities. That's interesting. And so, the government. <laughs> I mean, that's great. That's, and then they got together and did something really bad to him. I, that's what I've heard. I've read that. <laughs> yeah. I read. There's a book. My cousin. So my cousin and I. He's he's very. Um, He's very Christian, so he's, um, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty conservative, but he's one of the most logical people that I've ever met. And just, I, we disagree on certain things related to, you know, theology and, and politics, but there's never a time, and we just love, we have conversations like this, right? Mm-hmm. We go get a you know, drink and <laughs> talk for like three hours and have this kind of oh, conversation. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, if I'm ever questioning him on, you know, something related to his faith, he loves it. He's like, yeah, bring him, bring on the questions. He's like, pick it apart. Like yeah. he wants to have that, that kind of pushback. And you recommended a book I haven't got a chance to read yet, but it's when Jesus meets Socrates. Oh, I think Peter, I did recommend uh, Peter Keefe. Is that the name of, um, he's written a bunch of books. So when, yeah. when yeah, so-and-so awesome. meets Socrates, there's like yeah. eight or nine of them. I forget the guy's name, but yeah. So that's, that's more of like a of. stoicism kind of, yeah, that's it's, good. It's, Socrates is questioning everything, yeah. right? And that's yeah. like, that's the idea. That's what made me think of it. It's like Jesus, and I had not heard that before. I look forward to to hearing your sermon, digging into that at some point. Yeah. Good stuff. We should all be asking questions. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that we just accept um, what we're being told or we accept any, you know, specific political positions. And I, I think that's what, um, that's what I hope our, our party will be is it'll that it will be one that 
wants to do politics from the ground up and yeah. is wanting to engage people and bring people into that. And we were we were sharing the good news and the good gospel about four party with with someone earlier this week. And and I said to the person we were talking to, I said, it's possible that you could have several forward party candidates running um, in a particular race. Yeah. And none of them fully agree because they have different constituents that they are that they are serving. I said, so it's a whole nother way of doing politics. You will not be able to pin the party down to any one particular you can't label it as any one thing because that's what that person is doing for their constituency mm -hmm. and your four party person or whoever is doing, maybe doing something totally, totally different. I think people are scared of that and it is scary. and that complexity and that nuance. I think they're really, they really want to be able to say, no, you get in this, you get in this box and I want to be able to label you as this thing. Right. hundred percent. Depending on the day, of the week and time of the day and the, the policy. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to say. Right. Yeah. Cause information should be influencing us all the time as we are sorting through what is, what we believe is best for um, our country and our communities. Yeah, any number of issues, right? Yeah. Any number. Very nice. So you've been um, pretty politically involved for quite a while at this point, or when did you start to um, get involved with the, um, the caucus, the LBGTQ political caucus in Houston. Yeah. So as soon as I got back from, from New York, so around 2012, I uh, was very involved with them. I also served as their uh, treasurer for a while. I was the treasurer of the PAC and the, the C4. Um, I, so my seminary raised me to do this. Uh, Raphael Warnock graduated from my seminary. So this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, who attempted to assassinate Hitler, was a teacher and student at my seminary. Hmm. Reinhold Niebuhr and 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 his brother um, H uh, H Niebuhr. He the, the people who wrote the Serenity Prayer. The all of you know Reinhold Niebuhr was very much involved in politics uh, and 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 wrote a, a bunch of scathing things about liberals and conservatives back in the day. A great book called Children of Darkness and Children of Light. And in that book, he talks about how the children of light are very optimistic and they have undermined um, the importance of self-interest. And then he says, but the children of darkness, they know very well how to weaponize and use self-interest to advance their political uh, motives. Uh, so so my, my seminary, this is, even though I had disagreements with them, I always tell people they gave me my voice and then made me use my voice on them, <laughs> like right, like I literally organized sit-ins and all kinds of stuff while I while I was there. Um, and, oh, and that's interesting. And then they gave me, they graduated me with honors for pushing back against them and and how they operated the school. You got to respect that that institution for you know practicing what they yeah. preach. Yeah, but they were ready to see me go. I'm sure. Yeah. Too. Like they were like, get him out of here. Yeah, <laughs> he's right. Yeah, out. they were all like, where is he learning? To where are we? Because we had this little committee. We called it the SNCC committee, and because uh, it was black students, and we were. Um, so anyway, they they were like, where are y'all learning all this stuff from? Literally, we were like, this is what y'all taught us, and then after we get out of class, we sit up till three o'clock in the morning, strategizing on how we're going to like be subversive and call shit out, call out the things that you're doing that we don't, we don't agree with. And so, um, this is, that's who I am. So when I got back here, we were getting involved in the, the fight for Houston equal rights ordinance. And there was a lot of stuff going on at the legislature as it always is mm -hmm. regarding LGBTQ folks uh, last few years. Um, and I just felt really called to, to step in and to really, to really, um, push for that ordinance and, and, and encourage it getting passed. And, and what was the ordinance specifically? The, the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance was, was really meant to create uh, a mechanism for people in different classes or different demographics to be able to address any d discrimination they would run up against. Okay. For example, if a black guy was going into a bar and they said, you can't come into this bar because you're wearing sneakers. Yeah. But then the white guy just went into the bar and 
he was wearing sneakers, right? Mm -hmm. There were there would be a mechanism in place at City Hall where you could file a complaint and then they could investigate and go through the process they need to go through. Yeah. But they had all of that for veterans, for trans uh, transgender uh, persons. They had it for um, you know color, race, uh, women uh, in terms of pregnant. Like it was just a, it was a lot. There was no reason it shouldn't have passed, but. Um, Trans people in the restrooms is what tanked it. They just, the people who were against it just ran a bunch of commercials about there'll be a dude in the restroom and he's going to get your daughter. And they're like, they just, they hammered that in. So you had black people and women and veterans voting against their own interests because they were afraid that some dude in a dress would be in a restroom and would do something horrible to his wife or their children or, or something like yeah. that. When the truth is, dudes, if that's what you want to call them, have been going in the women's restroom for years, <laughs> right? They're that like trans women. Now, I, I wouldn't call them dudes, but I'm just saying that's the language they would use. Trans women have been using the women's restroom for years. So this is nothing, you know, and we even discovered that it was more likely that a kid would be molested in their own home by a relative. Yeah, I heard that thing there. <laughs> and it's like, so, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate, but I'm, I'm really happy that things have changed here in our city and, and there are more people willing to give transgender people medical care because that was another issue, right, uh, that we were, we, were, we were standing up for. So that, that was what the ordinance was for. Gotcha. It was named Hero. It excluded, uh, it, it did not... In building it, it didn't. There wasn't enough outreach to the black community, so they felt shut out. So, um, another faction of conservative people, white conservative people, were able to pay off and buy silence and votes from people. It was a mess. It was a mess, and and a lot of people voted against their own interests. That that's what I can tell you. <laughs> huh. And yeah. so, when when was this on the ballot? This was on the ballot, was it 2016, 2017, somewhere in there? Mm. I can't remember the exact year. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, I'm trying to remember if I was a pastor yet or if I was still, I think it was 2016. No, not 2016. It was before that. It had to have been somewhere around 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. But it yeah. was not 2016 because we were busy with other things. Other things on. in 2016. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. We had other stuff to set our hair on fire about in 2016. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just such a perfect example, though, of an issue that if you explained it like you explained it, that I guarantee you a majority of people would agree with, you know, just in, this, in the sense of, you know, if there's complete discrimination that's very obvious like that, right? And if it's explained that way and not ginning up all this emotional, you know, support for the opposition because of an, really like probably a very slim, it's like an edge case, right? right? That's not, the vast majority of examples don't have anything right. to do with that. Right. Right. And it's just distorting the actual, you know, yeah. meat of an issue. And that's like way too prevalent. That's this, the dynamic of, you know, all of the political discourse it seems these days. Yeah, it's interesting times politically. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. What would you, um, you're a deep thinker. I, I get the, I get the I sense. I try to be. Yeah. <laughs> I try to be, yeah. So what, what is your, what is your take on the current political dynamic of, of the United States right now? So I just wrote about this Friday, actually. Um, I think that we're trapped in between a power battle in between two political parties. And I think there are extremes that exist in, in both of them. And I think that both of these parties use policy and things to dangle kind of as a carrot to, mm -hmm. you know, to get people to, to vote. And, 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 for me, the vote around marriage equality that just happened, was it last month in January, it, it, or was it December? I can't remember. Uh, that vote 
we got it done. What happened with Roe versus Wade? Like, there were numerous opportunities. And I'm not even saying that I, like, I'm not saying I'm fully pro-choice. But what sure. I am saying is, when I look at getting stuff done, I don't see, I don't see that happening until, like, there's, like, this huge crisis. And then it's like, we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. And so, we're not going to be able to get Roe v. Wade done. So, let's cram through marriage equality because the gays are going to have our next and all of our money is going to dry up if mm -hmm. we don't get this done. And that goes for Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. I know there's a bunch of gay people that fund a lot of uh, Republicans, right? So we got it done. So I think we're being, there's, there's a game that's being played and it's a game of power. And for me as a Christian, uh, a follower of, of Jesus, there's analyzing who has the power? Why do they have it? How long have they had it? How are they using it? Like all of those kind of questions are questions that I've been asking myself. So it's yeah. not it's not just that we're politically divided. I believe that there's a source. There is something that is driving that division. And I think the average American is caught up in this battle. And we're literally just pawns in this game. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what pisses me off, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. When I get behind the curtain, the man behind the curtain, you know, like that, that thing right there really, really ticks me off. I think there's just no question in the world, like at all, that what we're seeing on the surface and clearly these political conversations we're having are just so ridiculous in many cases is not telling the whole story. What you see on CNN, what you see on Fox News, you're not getting... You're maybe getting, you know, tip of the iceberg as to what is actually going on, yeah. um, you know, behind the curtain, so to speak. What um, have you found any answers to those questions or any, any thesis that you would provide as to, you know, what power games are being played beneath the surface? I don't know that I can pinpoint the specific games that are being played. I do know that I feel like I know what the solution is. Well, that's even better. <laughs> And the solution is the forward party and any other party that uh, is going to stand with us and wants to also become a party in their state. Uh, I'm glad to see that the Common Sense Party in California has joined with the forward party. Uh, I think taxes in California are just absolutely ridiculous. But again, that's my political opinion. Uh, and I'm a Texan. So, so you're in Texas. You know, it's <laughs> got to have an opinion about taxes. Um, so. I, I think the forward party, I think these coalitions that we're building, so open primaries, uh, rank choice or star voting or approval voting, any of those. I know there's debates about which one is great. Any of it is better than what we have now. Right. Um, and multi-member districts that I'm also you know, passionate about that as well, too, as as much as possible. People should be able to go and talk to their representative and 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 them have something in common when it comes to politics. I yeah. think I think that is what it is. That now the 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 and I think that gets at the 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 problem. Okay. And and that problem is that if power is concentrated in the hands of a few mm -hmm. and and is concentrated in a binary, you're it's easier for most Americans to understand that. And it's also easier for these people to maintain that duopoly. Right. <laughs> right. And so that maintaining that is what keeps us kind of in the, in the situation that we, that we're in now. And, and I've, I, this, this, the same thing is true in most churches in that people want to be told what to think. Yeah. And what to do. So our job um, is to call people to a higher level of being and understanding and 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 to be able to understand the complexity and nuance. I think our call is to wake up. I know I'm phrasing this in theological language, but this is the personal is political and it's theology to me. It's, yeah. it's ethics to me. And I think this is this is what our movement is about. And so I like to see that the forward party is not saying poo-poo on the Libertarian Party or poo-poo on the Green Party. Like we're saying, like, join us. Like if you need more petitions signed, if you need to get in the game, we want we want everybody's voice in the game. I would rather have multiple choices. 
so that I can say, you know what? I think that Brian has what that's 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 what I'm looking for. Yeah. Right? And maybe it won't be in my political party. Maybe it'll be in another political party. But I'm not I don't have the chance now. I have no choice. I have to vote the lesser of two evils. And to me, that's oppression. That is not freedom. Yeah, you Jesus would not be pleased. <laughs> and that's never a good thing. It's <laughs> no. never a good thing. Yeah. And you had mentioned that 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 idea that you just that you just laid out there is that the duopoly itself, these very binary choices we have, that's a form of oppression. I mm-hmm. thought that was a very powerful way of phrasing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. You don't you don't have a choice. You have to you. And, and the other issue is, is, um, you know, you, you see it whenever these politicians are doing their, you know, three minutes of fame on CNN or MSNBC or Fox. They just repeat the same party line. Mm-hmm. And and there's no like I just when will someone say, look, this is what I think about this issue. This is what my constituents want. And so this is how I'm going to vote. I know that Christian cinema is is so maddening to some people right now. But like maybe we need more of that kind of just chaos and yeah. complexity. And like you should like. We just missed a great opportunity in electing the Speaker of the House. No Democrat thought to say, you know what? Let's flex some muscle here and tell him we will deliver the vote so he doesn't have to put these other whack a on the, on any of these committees. Nobody thought to do that. Nobody thought to build a coalition government because that's where we are. Yeah. You stay on your side. I'm going to stay on my side. I want you to have all the power you have right now because I don't want you messing with me when I have power. Mm-hmm. Instead of how do we work together to do this? And and one thing I wrote about this the other day is that like I there's <laughs> there, we should there should be people working across multiple aisles. Cuz the problem we have now that I think is going to get worse is that both parties are trying to figure out how to bring to heel all of the conflicting parties that are within their party. Mm. We're already in a multi-party system. Yeah. That's what's true. maddening about all this is because we know people are not standing up for what they believe because they have to toe the party line. But what would happen if you set all those people free? We would probably still be trying to pick a speaker of the house. <laughs> I would be okay with that. Yeah. Bring, um, let's have a national debate about it. Absolutely. Right. How many votes would that be by now? Probably like 450. I don't care. It could McCarthy's be still running. He's yeah, like, he's 451. Yeah, let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. But people would have to, you know, I know there, there are some liberals who would say that moderation is not a good thing, but you, people would have to. They would have to come to some form of consensus and moderation and, and actually build a government for the people. Mm-hmm. And I admire that about some other countries where they say, you know, they have to put together the government. We don't put together a government. We vote on a particular day and we know what the future is going to be from that day on. There is no public discourse or dialogue. There no. is there is nothing but the, the the aristocracy and the oligarchy. And we are there's the, the problem I have with this is that it goes against what I believe is the founding of this country. So yeah. we're actually not free right now. We actually have several kings and queens, as evidenced by people staying in Congress and from their 30s until their 80s. But I don't, anyway, I don't want to get in trouble with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're not ageist. <laughs> not ageist at all. I, 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 you know, you could be 80, whatever, and be there. But like, you've been there all your life, pretty much. That, that definitely limits your perspective if you've been in one place in general for that long. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so interesting. So you'd recommended a book to me. Um, I can't, I, I, every time I read that title, Agon, Agonistic by Ag- Sean, Chantel So Moore. I always say antagonistic and then I'm like agonistic. I have to do the <laughs> same thing. Like antagonistic, <laughs> agonistic. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so was, she talks a little bit about some of these concepts. Yeah. I was introduced to her by um, a minister in training at my church and uh, he graduated from Harvard and what I like about her from what I understand so far, uh, Chantal Mouffe, is that she proposes that 
Um, instead of us being antagonistic, we should be agonistic mm-hmm. in a sense that you're, if you don't believe what I believe politically, uh, you're not my enemy, you're my adversary. And so what I want to work on is how do I say you're not my adversary, right? I'd want to take it a bit further or bring it a bit closer. I don't know which would be the right way to do it, but I want to mm-hmm. say you're, we're, we're just, we're competitors. Yeah. And no matter who wins, we all still win because I know that you don't have my worst interests at heart, right? You want what's good for me. I want what's good for you. We want what's good for the country. We just have different ways of of getting there. We're playing the same game at the end of the day. We're yeah. good sports about it. We shake hands afterwards. Yes. That, and that's actually exactly how I started reading just, um, that book uh, last week, so I haven't finished it. But yeah. um, I came to that. I actually had the same thing with with the way that she phrased the way that um, she phrased it: adversaries, not enemies. Mm-hmm. And that made me think: oh, it's a competitor. Yeah. I love to compete. Yeah. And I don't hate the person I'm competing yeah. against. I just love to compete. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. You know, and it's like even in a a competition of ideas, even having just a conversation with someone I disagree with, you know, you have these most people are like, I don't want to talk politics because I don't want to yell mm-hmm. and get into these like heated arguments. And it's like, well, I'm not I'm not trying to like argue and get mm-hmm. mad at you. It's just like I'm interested. Let's have yeah. a conversation yeah. and see where I'm wrong and I'm gonna be. And yeah, you're probably gonna be too some some of the time. And it's yeah. it's interesting, it's fun, you know, yeah. it's it's necessary for the kind of the evolution of the best ideas to, to rise to the top. Yeah, for sure. I, I wonder if, you know, I always have these harebrained ideas. You'll have to forgive me. I go way off with these ideas, but I'll like, go for it. what, what would it look like if, if we actually had senators and, and representatives um, at the state and federal level that <clears throat> would actually get on the floor and have a debate? Like actually have a debate. Don't shoot all these political darts and, you know, talk about people's moral care. Don't mm-hmm. get into all the cult. Don't, don't do any of that. Let's have a debate about the issue. And what if we had some sort of mechanism via the blockchain where your constituents can vote on Love it. what they just heard in the debate? And then you can come back to the floor and say, well played, sir. My constituents like what you had to say. We're going to go with that. Yeah. Versus we got to keep this thing going and keep fighting about it and not like what civility. Can we, can we just have some of that, you know? Yeah. And just like in that situation, it's just, okay, this, you know, well played. Like you said, yeah. it's, it's agree to disagree and okay, yeah. maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, yeah. you know, and even if I'm still Sticking with my position, 70% of the American people who I'm elected to serve Mm -hmm. think that you're right. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're right today, right? Here's the other thing we don't own. This policy may be absolutely ridiculous 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such an important Don't ask, don't tell had its moment in the sun because at that time, how else were gay people going to serve in the military? Like Bill Clinton was, from my understanding of history, he was, that was the only way that was going to get passed. Yeah. Don't ask, don't tell. Then the day came when it was, that's a ridiculous policy. Let's get rid of it. Right? Yeah. That's the other Times thing. Change. If you lose a debate and your policy doesn't win, it doesn't mean that it's not, not the end. It's not the end. Yeah. Right? It may come back later in some other form. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that Ford is definitely really um, getting behind is this idea that you don't have to ideologically be a purist and it's yeah, we can make some good progress on an issue, move in the right direction, and that's a lot better than nothing. Yeah. And then maybe we have this conversation again in three years and we're further along and then we get further along at yeah. that point. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's so important. Yeah. So what's your what's your hope for the the forward party outside of, you know, some of the some of the things that that we've talked about is is elect electoral reform. Is that what kind of drew you in? And, and, and how, how did you find the forward party? Oh, my gosh. I don't know if I should come out of the closet about this. <laughs> I don't know if Suck I can. You. I probably should. I will. Why not? I'll go for it. <laughs> um, actually, I was, I was kind of on Twitter. I was um, part of the Renew America movement. Okay. So, um, and through the Lincoln Project and seeing some other never Trumpers and seeing... Um, the Renew America movement form, I was just following them for a while. Um, I, 
I know very well, I think I'm pretty well acquainted with progressive liberal agendas and policies and approaches. Sure. Um, but what I've been fascinated by is learning more about conservatism and what it truly means. And so I started paying attention to the Renew America movement to see what that was about and the Lincoln Project. And then that, um, through the four party, I also found uh, Principles First movement, which has like 12 different principles about conservatism. And, and one night, my husband and I, we were watching RuPaul's Drag Race and having some drinks. And I said, hey, why don't you read this, but don't read the top, because I didn't want him to see that it said conservative. I said, just read these and tell me if you agree with them. And he read it. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I love all of these. I agree. With I said, this is a conservative gotcha. platform. <laughs> right. And, and so like it, it and so so I started wondering like what what is this about and what does this mean and how do what does it mean that these conservative principles and what have we missed and what has been demonized about them that is probably very helpful to our, our democracy. And so actually okay. I came to the forward party by way of a conservative uh, spinoff movement. Interesting. Right? Because RAM merged with forward party. So I come from the RAM side of the merger. Very nice. So, what was the name of that um, the twelve principles? One more time. I actually principles to... first. Principles first. Principles first movement. I definitely want to check. That yeah, out. they're having a summit uh, first weekend in March, I believe. It's twelve different principles, and I like those principles. So. I'll, I want to check them out. I um, that's that's such a great story too, because mm -hmm. I mean, how many you see those examples on on cable news and you know social media some of the time, where it's, you'll read a policy to someone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're identifying one way on the right or the left. You read the policy and they're like, yeah, that yeah. sounds great. And they're like, yeah. did you know Barack Obama proposed it? And they're like, no, actually, I hate that policy. You know? <laughs> right. And it's right. like, yeah, it's so dumb. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day. But uh, what does the future hold professionally and I, for, for Leslie Jackson? So this is an interesting question. It is a question that I am I'm I'm discerning, right? I'm discerning the answer to this question right now. Um, I have applied to attend Chicago Theological Seminary to work on my Doctor of Ministry degree, and um, in public ministry. So I will be focusing on much of what we have discussed here today, and uh, trying to better understand uh, Reinhold Niebuhr and you know, his talk about children of light, children of darkness. And what I would like to study, I don't know if it'll happen, but is really what, from the principles first, uh, what, what about those principles has the progressive movement missed that that's right in those principles? And where do you find areas of compromise uh, in them? So for example, uh, when a conservative says limited government, uh, what I hear is not let's get rid of welfare and rip all of those. When I hear limited government, I think you shouldn't be deciding who I marry. Mm -hmm. You actually, you shouldn't even be involved in issuing licenses. I shouldn't have to pay you <laughs> to sanction my relationship. Like I'm that conservative about things when it comes to freedom. A lot of these areas in which we have to go and pay for things to be legitimized, I find that to be oppressive. And so what does it mean to explore limited government where government has stuck its hands into places that, that, it, sh that it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be in? So where are those areas where we can find some agreement with conservative principles, um, in particularly progressives, uh, and, and how do we move in a place in our politics to where we'll, we'll be able to understand that. That's great. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that, that generally that idea, right. Of like re-examining your, the opposition of your, you know, your beliefs at that moment and saying like, they probably get something right. Yeah. Cause that's the truth. Right. I firmly believe that, that both parties and we need people of, of both ideologies, um, you know, to be what this country is. Right. And that's that's just I'm I'm a huge fan of that that concept. I'd love to someday like examine that over the history mm -hmm. of the U.S. and be like, where did you know these? Where were the conservative principles right, and where were the the progressive principles right, and like how that made America, yeah, you know what it what it is the 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 great yeah. country that it is. Yeah, I I I I think I've been called an enigma because I will. <laughs> 
That's a fair. I think I'm that's a good tr- word. I keep for you. trying to bring things together that probably don't go together. Um, but I, I have to have hope. I have to have hope that that's possible and that that's what God is calling me to do. I mean, my resume testifies to that, like it's eclectic and I'm bringing all of these things together to make sense. Um, you know, I recently came out to my congregation as being bi because for so many years I never, I couldn't, I couldn't say that because in my family at the time when I was figuring things out, that would mean you can choose. And so if you can choose, why are you choosing, right? And Mm. so now we have language where people understand that like, I can say I'm bi, but I can also say it's obvious what my dominant choice is, right? (laughs) Right? Like, and so like there, and, 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 and for that to be okay. So in my life, in my ministry, in my resume, I think this is who God has created me to be is this person that is not supposed to be doing the things that he's doing, but he keeps doing it and, and things happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't make sense, but it makes sense. I love it. I yeah. think that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Leslie, great talking to you. This has been a, a very fun conversation. Thank you. We do have one. We do have one more uh, piece to to our interview. It's the okay. lightning round. Okay. So these are the, the real. Oh my god. These are the real questions. These okay. are the hard hitting questions. Okay. okay. All right. Ready. Mm-hmm. Favorite thing about Texas. It's big. There we go. <laughs> Everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Favorite book or movie that you would recommend to people right now? Oh my gosh. Uh, favorite book would be Children of Light, Children of Darkness, because that's what I'm reading right now on top of... I'm going to check that out. Right? Yeah. And in terms of movie, I mean, like, Star Wars is my jam. You can't go wrong. Pick any of them. Maybe not the last three, but any of the other ones. Here. The originals. Yes. yes. Tough to beat. <laughs> yeah. I, I was a big Star Wars fan yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. Nice. As I told you before, Darth Vader was really not the villain. It mm. was the duopoly. It was the Jedi and the Sith. I don't know if we've talked about that. That could be a whole different. That is how Darth Vader got created. Mm. All right, I don't. We're, we're in the lightning. <laughs> everybody so agrees. I, I know everybody has to agree with that. Like he did not just. But go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. What's too, the next? That's good. That's yeah. good though. And we'll talk about that off <laughs> off the air <laughs> <Okay>. here. <laughs> All right, dog or cat person. Uh, I have both. Okay. I told you I was by nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. What's one word that describes what attracted you to the Ford party? Freedom. If you could live anywhere else other than Texas, where would it be? Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Interesting. You vacation there? A lot. (laughs) So, yeah, that's where I would go. Very nice. Yeah. And if there's one thing that you're hopeful that the Ford party, one word, uh, one change you, you were hopeful the Ford party... Uh, will bring about what would that be a reform of our democracy beautiful yeah thank you great stuff Leslie thank you so much thank you thanks for having me absolutely <laughs> thanks everyone <laughs>